Yo, C-Mask Nation, back here with me for another Christian Masculinism episode are Mike, Will, and Nick. And we're following up on an episode that we did two or three weeks ago, a masculinism and mental health topic that I think is absolutely central to masculinism today. It's because everyone's everyone, uh, according to Will Noland, besides the saints, is struggling with some major mental health issue, non-negligible mental health issue. It just means, um, you know, the psyche is just the suke in Greek. It just means the, the, the rational part of the soul. And it's absolutely important to aver that this isn't one of those episodes where you go sea mask and like fast food or sea mask and the new children's movies that are out for the summer or like sea mask and skincare or something like this is <laughs> this is central this is elemental to what we're trying to impart to you guys out there who are listening by the way make sure you're subscribed to this channel if you're watching this i'm pushing it on my channel i hope um all you guys are as well uh, nick nick will mike but the, i'll just say this um as a kind of preliminary thought then i have a second preliminary thought but i want you guys to respond to this this is this is not some boutique issue right like i expressed a moment ago like mental health is it, it just means if you're a man and your mental health is salubrious then you will be leading and all four cylinders will be firing if it's an american muscle car let's say all eight cylinders are firing and you will be not only ha have the proper spiritual and mental and you know, physiological uh, pieces in place on the board and, and pragmatic pieces in place on the board to lead your wife and kids. But you'll be doing so in a way that leaves constancy, this old Protestant term, constancy, as the, kind of the fixture of your day, whether you're a more, I don't know, um, schedule-obsessed person, routine-obsessed person, or a less. Constancy should be the mark of your day and anyone who knows who, who struggled with mental health, any man, you know, constancy is what's removed when you're going through um, an anxiety, a fear, an obsession, wh whatever, whatever is haranguing you. So would you guys mind just saying um, something, maybe, maybe Mike uh, open with you on why this is not a boutique show. This is central to what we do on CMASK dealing with mental health comprehensively. Yeah, it's not a boutique issue in the sense that obviously this has been around since human beings have been around. I think it's what's unique about our perspective is that it's not coming from the, okay, dude, it's okay. Just sit down and have a good cry and go talk to a secular therapist that's going to prescribe you these drugs um, without talking about all the things men should be doing, starting first and foremost with bolstering really powerful prayer and uh, spiritual lives. Um, you know, uh, it, it Will, you said something so beautifully a couple of weeks ago. Um, the saints being the most mentally healthy people. And so we're all going to touch upon that because, it, you know, I think we all agree in the sense that uh, mental health is more so, especially now as people become more and more entrenched in their sin and the desires of the flesh, a diabolic issue more than anything. But to your point about rigidity and structure and constancy, Tim, um, and we were speaking about this before the failed recording yesterday, is that when like anxiety and OCD takes over, it's like all of a sudden somebody's in the cockpit of your mind and your life and you're no longer really in control. That constancy is removed. It's now replaced with with chaos. There's nothing systematic about, you know, your brain or anything in your day. It's complete shutdown. And then I don't know if you find the same thing, Tim. Time just seems to just zip by at like turbo speed. I'm going down the Google rabbit hole with like hypochondria and all of a sudden I've lost like three or four hours. My schedule's way behind. What's helped yeah. me huge is maintaining proper sleep routine, um, workflow toward my day or in my day, having segmented, you know, structure throughout the day. Um, same thing with my nutrition, same thing with training, this element of like having some kind of a control over my life, almost not giving my mind enough time to focus on anything but the tasks of the day. And so I think it's such an important conversation to have because I think 99.9% .9 of the mental health discussion out there is very fruity and doesn't really do anything productive. It's like these guys aren't even on a basic level addressing their faith, their spirit lives, their 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 physical health, 
do the nutritional health, but instead are going right to SSRIs and benzodiazepines and secular therapy without, you know, it's like putting a big, you know, a, a bandage on a gaping wound that's quite often starting as a spiritual wound. Yeah, the secular therapy, um, Nick, you comment on this, the secular therapy isn't straightforwardly, it's not specific. The only, the only remedy for the ailment that, that is specific is like benzos or, or, or drugs of some, yeah. some sort. They, when you, you recommended a great book to me a couple weeks ago called Brain Lock. And that book is like the only specific way, non-drug specific way I've ever seen to deal with uh, OCD. So I, I, I'd love to hear you, you talk about that and, and why that's central. Keeping your brain out of brain lock is central to masculinism. And then even just the, the, the spiritual component of this that we were talking to Brit about yesterday, if you, you would comment on those things. It's just integral to masculinity because of that point about constancy, I think. Like as a as a guy, you expect of yourself and you know it's expected of you to just just have your stuff together. And it, there's something just so perfectly humiliating about mental health, even the 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 phrase mental health, because it's like there <laughs> Somebody would look at you and be like, dude, there's not even something wrong. There is not a child dangling from a tree. The home is not on fire. The finances are in fine order. What the hell is wrong with you? And so it's just so perfectly emasculating to think or not to think to experience a problem that just exists between the ears that nobody else can really see. And it feels like I think anybody who's dealt with actual mental health issues would much rather have kinetic issues in their life. Um, and I think I was, I don't have a pen, so I'm going to have to use playing cards, but I was thinking about like who it affects. And I think if you, if the bell curve for those watching is th this is your average bell curve with the middle, the midwits being at the 80%, it seems to be the case that the, the more high performing you are, and you move toward the right, the more likely you are to have mental health issues. And then it somehow gets back together at the very end where the most excellent people, you know, 145 IQ plus geniuses have somehow managed to either totally agree to whatever diabolic nonsense is going on. And I think that's where you get like maybe the people who run the world or um, they have uh, extirpated the demons, so to speak, through virtue and have made peace with it and they can be giga geniuses and not troubled. But that pocket where you just, you're not a midwit anymore. You're a, a well-functioning man with a, an above average IQ. The further to the right you get there, I think the worse it gets um, to a point. And, and that's a struggle as well because further to the right you get on the bell curve, like the more excellence you want and the more excellence you expect of yourself because you can know the good more thoroughly. And then it just messes with you more because you see how far away from it, how far away from the good you are. Um, yeah, Brain Lock's been, been a heck of a book. Uh, just got to the part in it where he was basically pushing back against the materialists who say that um, the brain can teach the brain that the chemicals in your brain can teach the other areas of your brain, how to be a better brain. He's like, that's nonsense. There's something non-physical. He doesn't say this explicitly, but he says the mind, he says the mind can in, in apply correction to the brain and the brain will follow suit, which is just, you know, the soul, the, the intellect itself and the will can terraform the brain. Uh, to become healthier and to think about things more properly. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's important just for me as a guy who wants to become a patriarch and then watching you guys as patriarchs, like I'd love it if the only problems I have on my plate when I become a dad or a husband are things like, Hey, the, you know, the car just broke down and we need to get to this location tonight for this reason i'd be like 
put me in coach. Like I'm going to figure this out so well, y'all are going to be dazzled. Right. But when it's in my own head and, so, and like something breaks and I'm just freaking out on the inside and you can observe me and not know what's going on. That's where it's like, all right, I got to figure this out and I got to figure it out. Stat. And I don't know if you guys feel the same way with respect to it, there being a finish line, but I'd love for like the mental health thing to be completed at some point. So I don't like this ongoing journey thing. And I hope it's not that, like, I know that's the spiritual life. I would love if this was just like a one day you wake up and you figured it out. I'm well, going to hurt your feelings now, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Will's first words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't think there is a finish line until you make it to heaven. Mm -hmm. I think in purgatory, mm -hmm. what's happening is mental illness is still being worked on. And mm -hmm. if you understand the full spiritual reality of what being human entails, that's just got to be the case. When before we started doing this couple of shows, I was going through this big book by Ripuga, Introduction to the Science of Mental Health. It's like 800 pages. Super interesting. I really recommend anyone who wants to look into this in more detail has a look at that book. And the way he lays it out makes so much sense compared to secular psychotherapy. Because in a nutshell, I've just written down here the so mental health means the proper ordering of the intellect, the will, and the appetites. A, a human being is mentally healthy when the intellect, the will, and the appetites all function properly. Now, that's why I was saying that we're all mentally ill, unless we're saints, because we don't have that proper mm -hmm. functioning. And that's because of original sin, which has all kinds of um, effects on us, even after baptism which can't actually take away the like the after effects of it. it. It can free us from the devil's clutches, but we're still left with the disordered inclinations that we have as fallen beings in a fallen world. So what does that mean then? If we're all living with original sin, we're all going to struggle with our mental health. The, the appetites are going to rule the soul in a way that they shouldn't if we were completely mentally healthy. The intellect as well is going to reason falsely that what the appetites are saying is good, actually is good. And then the actual sins that we commit are going to make us stupid and darken the intellect even more. So that idea of the finish line, yeah, maybe if you make it to heaven mm. when you're when you're perfect, because nothing imperfect can enter heaven. But otherwise, we got mentally ill people on earth and in purgatory as well. No, well, that could it be sorry, go ahead, Nick. That seems to give rise to a definition of mental illness then as not psychiatric, not neurological, and something that can be ameliorated via the virtue that is religion. If 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 that's disordered trifecta you're talking about. So I mentioned the book that I started a while ago, but didn't finish because I didn't like it. I was scared of it. The about Bishop's investigation into the paranormal. And they were talking about how there are mental patients who were observed to have like marked improvements when a family member who had had an abortion um, actually had a mass offered uh, for that baby that was murdered. Wow. And the institutionalized family member didn't even know that this was happening. But oh. something about at that time, the clinicians in the institution, they noticed that something was lifted. So I think you're right. It isn't something that can be addressed through, uh, purely through chemicals or the whole lens of psychiatry. Given that a human being is a spiritual creature, look, to be a rational animal, we have that spiritual component you got to take that into account. What book is that? Uh, the Paranormal, A Bishop Investigates. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that too. So <clears throat> I've been thinking about this a lot lately as well. And it's really interesting now we're relating that intellect and will and will and intellect, which one informs the other first in proper order. Um, kind of reminds me of my journey to 
to Catholicism, the intellect informed my will, therefore I entered the church, where I find a lot of times, especially in my walk as a Protestant, it was my will that informed my intellect and kind of inverted that. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great recommendation. That just gave me chills. But in this topic of um, mental health, could it be, I mean, it sounds like it is, I mean, just something to explore out loud, the appetite informing the will, the will informing the intellect. And so that trifecta is inverted. So therefore, all these, these disordered desires of, you know, sex, drugs, mm. alcohol, food is coming from the belly up instead of the top down, wow. where it should be intellect informing will informing appetite i think that, that sounds, sounds very interesting given how or in and if you expand the definition of appetite into just the belly the the entity which responds to fears and right. and hungers then the the belly bubbles the fear up into the will which then addles the intellect Right. That does that sounds like a very one to one description of obsessive compulsive behavior and just general neurosis. Tim Tim will nail you know this what? one because it's will, will follows intellect in Thomistic psychology, and then you've got the concupiscible Ooh. and the irascible appetites. It's pretty much what Mike just said, right, Tim? Yeah, it's it's really technical. So, like, if you follow the the, the majority of Thomas on the anthropology, uh, it's it's quite complex. Actually, it's not not very simple at all. And there's a minority of even Thomas that are not, that think that the the interrelation between will and intellect is um, almost deterministic. So you have libertarian. It doesn't mean economic libertarian, but like. Basically, there are five steps of making a decision, and every step involves the intellect and the will. And the intellect presents the the, the different pieces of the decision to the will. And the um, majority of Thomists are very, very careful. Not I just don't want to be getting screamed at in the comments by Thomas. Not to say that the will is the mere ratifier. That, that it, it has to have a... Um, an active role beyond just ratifying. Yes, this is good. Eleanor Stump in her famous Aquinas tome um, gives a really, really, really particular account of this. And it's basically been accepted by all those Thomas. So what they want to avoid is to say that, you know, it just goes, intellect presents this part to the will and the will ratifies that. So it moves the intellect to the next part of the decision. And it it particularizes it and arranges what the logistics, and then it presents that part to the will. Do you keep going? My mentor, um, St um, Stephen Jensen, at, uh, at at one of the schools I've been to, says it this way: the re the way that the will, and this has big implications for obsessive compulsive disorder. That Nick, you'll love this. The way that Stump and the majority of Thomas describe the will not just being a passive ratifier where its only job is to ratify what the intellect has already shored up and said okay basically this is what we need to go do is by dis literally decide i'd forgotten about this till you guys brought this up it does um i think at step four out of five intellect well intellect well intellect well they each of the steps has a name that stump confers at, at the end of step four the will takes the active role in saying Okay, if you say, well, what do I want for dessert, licorice or chocolate? This is the example Jensen gives. And you go back and forth and you're weighing, remember the syllogism, Nick? We've been talking a lot about the syllogism vis-a-vis -vis OCD. You're weighing out, okay, well, here are the ways that licorice is good. Here are the ways chocolate's good. And your, your well says, yes, yes, these are true. Move it to the next stage. Once you think you're like, well, what would be better for tonight? chocolate because its virtues outweigh for tonight's particulars licorice or maybe i'm having tummy problems so i'll have licorice because that's got the added benefit whatever it is once you move to a preponderance of the evidence this is all happening sort of instantaneously then the will takes the extra and for the first time active step not just a ratifier of saying i'm going to will to shut down the intellect to, to Whoa. shut down the <laughs> So that's how Jensen puts it. And I, when the first time I read this, anthropology is really hard. 
uh, Thomistic epistemology and anthropology is really hard. The first time I read this, I was like, oh, I got it. So, so Jensen, you're saying chocolate and licorice. I was like, but I'm like every few years, a not well person. And I'm deliberating between like, am I dying or not dying? <laughs> It's a willed decision. So I immediately applied it to the OCD of hypochondria. Well, okay, and okay. I said, yeah, so it's an, an act of the will, like an act of faith that's an act of will, that just says, I'm not going to deliberate about this anymore. And that is the most important role of the will in the process. Not it, In steps one, two, and three, it's just a passive ratifier. It's more than that. because something funky happens i won't go into the technicalities if the will is just a passive ratifier all the way it's not actually fully okay. rational hang on that so that's incredible <laughs> but i think as as a fellow sufferer of ocd you would probably agree that the will taking the active role is done so because there's a gun to the will's head called fear or the appetites is that because that's how it feels to me that like I because we've we've talked so much about how reason is just jettisoned when it comes to mental illness, where like you can know that you know that you know you can have the golly gee dang blood test in your hand and it doesn't matter. And actually it talks about this in Brain Lock. I, I forgot to bring this up to you, Tim. He he said it in passing. He said OCD can get so bad you can be looking at the locked door and not know what locked means anymore. Mm -hmm. it's like okay so now reason's gone and it's right. like the will has commandeered it but the will would never do something like that on its own right because the first principle of uh sufficient reason like do the good avoid the evil we want to do the good so why would it do that if if practical i would reason. Yeah. Yeah. thank you practical reason um if the the appetites aren't like just jammed in the on position of the alarm system and i'm wondering if that's where the diabolic can be relevant because as we talked to somebody recently just keep them very anonymous um they were presented by a demon of suicide and the silver-tongued convincing speech of this demon took their will and shut down the intellect and they believed everything and then tried to kill themselves. Mm. And it's like, that's what OCD feels like where reasons utterly powerless, completely powerless in OCD. The will is taken over, but it's doing so because there's this like screaming in your head that like, it's true. It's true. It's true. And, and like, you're going to die. It's bad. It's bad. And you have to act this way. I think speaking to, the gun to the head because i know exactly what that is um I, I i feel that in my soul what causes me what prevents me from going down the rabbit hole now is that what who who is that gun the the, the gun has to be faith or it's going to be the enemy mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be god holding the gun to your head to to, to your will saying trust me mm -hmm. or it's going to be the enemy saying just just continue to worry and stress and that's why you know it's a stupid it's a stupid statement but like worry is like atheism in action it's like the faith is that thing that bridges the gap it's that gun to the head it's god and that's what causes me nine times out of ten well now getting close to ten times out of ten to drop the phone and just to keep walking i was going in i had this lump on my midsection for a couple of years never really got it checked out then the worry started to bubble up I was going back and forth between surgeon and doctor and nobody really knew and whatever and I, I remember it was like two or three weeks ago i was walking into the ultrasound office and i was it was peaceful i was just like god i'm only losing hours of my precious life however i have i have, I have left here worrying about this it's, it's your will i said the worst case scenario which is never usually never is is i get the worst case scenario which is the best case scenario because i win either way is i get to see you sooner hopefully or I get to stick around so I'm good. It's all good. It's faith. It was like, wow. dude, and, and I'm telling you, I struggle with it deeply. I walk into the ultrasound room and it was like overwhelmingly positive news. And I leave, I'm like, praise God. But like that gun to the head that stopped me from like, okay, either I'm going to drink because I'm so stressed or I'm just going to be completely okay. That gun to the head was God. It has to be so God. We, you, we just between what you said and what Tim said has isolated the variable in the equation to the diabolic or the Holy Spirit, basically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as the thing that is um, 
inflaming the, the person and inflaming the soul. It's like, it's either the good spirit or the bad spirit. It sounds like that that's, that's where we've isolated the variable. And then everything that happens downstream from that might be, uh, emphasized depending on your personality, how, you know, how many IQ points you have under the hood is going to determine what you do with that inflammation. Um, childhood trauma, generational curses, the personality of the people in your life, you know, how does, how does your wife or your girlfriend respond when you're in these times of crisis is going to determine how these things play out. But I guess that's all downstream from like that original thing. So that makes me wonder then like if a psych ward patient can improve when a family member has a mass offered to them, how much is going on that we aren't taking into account that because we're sort of myopic, we're almost solipsistic with this. Where who knows what's going on that we can't see, but then it like gets to us and we're like, well, this is like my data is all of the data that there is. And it's informing like because you can't see behind you, you're like, this is what the world is out there. It's it's bad. It's fear. It's danger. It's like you have no idea what's going on that precipitated all that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Were you going ahead? Well, no, uh, what Nick was saying and what Mike said as well. I haven't got OCD, but is fear a big component of it? Is, oh, is, is it mainly fear? It's, yeah. It, yeah. Will, There's let multiple me manifestations <laughs> let, of, of let me it for you. sure. <laughs> All yeah, three of us yeah. are like, no, no, me, me first, me first. It's very scary. <laughs> it's so scary. <laughs> very scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fear. It's anxiety. Like, it's interesting because I see it. I see it manifest in a couple of different ways. For me, it's it's like it's mainly health and then maybe some financial, not as much anymore. And then with my wife, it's like cleanliness and, and, and orderliness. Yep. And for me, it's yep. fear. For her, it's just like it's just anxiety that something's going to be and for and, and i guess it, i guess that is also fear too but the manifestations of it are slightly somewhat unique in how they present the, the, the it, itself cuz the cleaning part i don't struggle with at all I'm like ah well whatever yeah but yeah. her it's like it, it used to be this like big you know it just it, it an all consuming obsession Will, yeah will that's if exactly i may be what so it is bold for... sorry tim it's exactly what it is for me and stuff like go ahead nick if I may be so bold, Will, knowing what I know about your schedule, there's one of two options. You either have some version of OCD or you are a living saint. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I've got some version of OCD there because I'm definitely not a saint. The um, the thing I was thinking about with the fear is that that's to do with the the irascible appetite and thinking about the the perception of future evils that – you're not going to be able to overcome. And yeah. wasn't it last time we talked about this, one of you guys brought up the fact that there's so much in scripture about not being afraid. It's yeah. re repeated again and yeah. again. And why is that? Why as Christians should we not be afraid? Because of our confidence in God as our omnipotent helper. Because if he's all powerful, then whatever perception of future evil you might have, you need to understand that you're going to overcome it or whatever else. If you don't through his permissive will, that's still going to work out for your good anyway. And I've got a couple of verses from scripture here that I think sum it up really well. Uh, the Lord is my rock and my strength. God is my strong one. In him will I trust. Now, if you can really, I know it's easy to read that, right? And just accept it as an idea. But if you can actually feel it and live it out, that's a big difference. And I think yeah. when I come to moments in life when I'm feeling more anxious, it's normally because that's just an idea in my head rather than something that I'm actually fully living out in my heart properly. So in him will I trust. Uh, you have hoped in the Lord mighty forever. The name of the Lord is a strong tower that just runneth to it and shall be exalted. So that's it. That's what the real pillar of support in your life is supposed to be. And whenever you're depending just on yourself and your own abilities to be able to meet challenges, whenever you're getting anxious about the future and trying to plan things out perfectly, when you're not able to give yourself that level of control, you can't have that 
um, perfection in your life, even if you have a blueprint for it, you can't actually make it real. That perfection isn't yours to give is because right. you're almost trying to take the place of God in your own life. Mm -hmm. Well, this is why I think, I think Nick might be right in that binary. I, I do. I do. I mean, it, I don't want to say it publicly and embarrass you, but yeah, the, the, all of the passages, even Jesus in the fowls of the air in scripture, old Testament and new say, look, the, the, the children of God, the friends of God do not fear. And I'm like, well, I, I know I'm, I str struggle and I think, overcome i i don't have habitual mortal sin that i struggle with but that doesn't mean i'm like a living saint because i struggled so much with the fear and even the fact that you're like oh wait so fear is what drives ocd for men women women don't have the same abstraction to fear that men do women only fear something when it's in their immediate presence and then it kind of just goes away um it's it's a little bit more like um um well, I'd say a little more like children, but I think even young boys can abstract fear more. But women don't tend to have have this. They they tend to struggle with like, oh, the household's such a wreck. I'm it's so bad. I just can't live like this. Um, it, you know, like my house is super clean, and Steph is not very OCD anymore. But if there's any aspect of it, it's just like Mike's. But where I can go in certain months of certain years, just completely fear-based OCD. And you asked, oh, so is fear a part of this? And me and Will, and me and Mike and, and Nick are like, <laughs> yes. So I just think maybe the fact that you can actually make yourself in your rational will mm -hmm. palpate mm -hmm. the the uh, fearlessness of the Christian. It attests may, maybe you're you're closer to to living saints in this way. I don't think it's a bad lit litmus test. I'm not I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying it's it's something I sometimes suspect anyway, but, um, you're a very good man, but it, yeah, fear, fear's like the only thing I don't, I don't struggle with habitual sin. Once I know there's some things, a mortal sin, it's like, I will not do that thing. Even something that's like a bigger venial sin. Like people piss me off on Twitter. I just, I, I don't need to go on Twitter. I don't have an addictive personality. I just get hooked in by fear once every few years. And it will be, you guys know, April, May, June. I think when we did that previous last comment here that previous mental health show i think i'd come out of the the woods for a little bit for two or three weeks it was about three has, weeks well it was about three weeks and that was in that time i'm kind of back in it now as yeah. nicholas knows. so there's <laughs> something very interesting going on with what's being set up by you three at present with this i, I think that fear is the opposite of worship and if you think about it in terms of trust and love with somebody that you know um, if you don't trust somebody you're always going to be checking to make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do and they're not going to hurt you yeah and it's like okay so you have god who never breaks his word and loves you more than anyone ever could and wants to take care of you. And so by definition, fear must be insulting to him, must hurt his yep. feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's also worship of the devil because you're saying that the wiles of the devil will triumph over God. And then, but then like our reason kind of kicks in and says like, yeah, but there is tragedy. Loved ones die. People get sick. The innocent are killed. Tragedy strikes all the time. So, what, why should I trust God if all of these things are true and I've experienced them? It's not only that I know they're true for other people, but also I've experienced tragedy. So like, why would I trust him again? So then you're kind of in this interesting predicament where having experienced tragedy, you still have to make an act of the will and say that not just that good things are going to happen, but that everything's going to be okay ultimately, like broad picture ultimately. And I think that requires an awareness of post-death stuff or in like a contact with heaven and hell um, that brings people perspective that alleviates fears 
when you're when you're cogitating on heaven and hell, it kind of fixes what's what's going on now, and you get a bit more of that relaxed present mindset of it. Um, which is why demons keep you either in the future or the past and not in the in the present moment or not contemplating on heaven and hell, which is what's talked about in the screw tape letters. But Psalm, there's a reason why Psalm 91 is an exorcism prayer. Why it's like a sacramental exorcism prayer. Psalm 91, the uh the psalm, incidentally enough, that Satan quotes to tempt Christ in the desert. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And it goes on with, he will save you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Like, he's faithful. He's not just good. He's faithful to you specifically. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So that's the part that Satan quotes to Jesus. Throw yourself off this cliff and let the angels come and rescue you because it says, and then he quotes Psalm 91, that this is what they'll do. And Christ comes back and says, you know, you'll, you shall not tempt the Lord uh, with tragedy. It's like, I wonder how much we're tempting God with tragedy by cogitating on tragedy all the time just speaking personally here god will you know what Mike. you know what's really interesting about that too I don't, maybe there's an association maybe there's not um tim you're a hypochondriac obviously so am i i have obsessed and cogitated so much on these things that they have produced psychosomatic symptoms oh <laughs> take a seat <laughs> it, like, like i'm not i'm not joking there was a period of time i was obsessing about lymphoma and i would get night sweats and i would have a lot of those those symptoms there were you name any number of things i obsessed over them so much almost like this tempting god with tragedy piece that it's almost like how much of that is god saying okay i mean you're well, it's also prayer thing. it's prayer think right, about like is, the yeah. whole think about like the the new agers who talk about manifesting and yeah right uh, you, you speak it into it speak it All right. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're good. <laughs> Sorry, I bumped that. Um, you sort of speak it into existence. Imagine if that kind of obsession was on the Holy Spirit yeah. and on good things and on blessings. Why in the freaking world is that so impossible for us to do? Like yeah. we're like we're like worshiping Satan. Because when you mm -hmm. worship God, you're singing, you're dancing, you're singing his praises, you're saying he's blessed me. You start that's like what the Psalms are, like what well, the happy psalms are. David's like, he led me beside green pastures, he took care of us, he he gave us all this victory in battle. You're like singing the praises of God. That's what the Psalms are. Like, we are worshiping Satan. Like, why is that the disposition? Well, well I want to be careful there. there. I think thematically right. there's Sorry. there's a yeah. lot. <laughs> Don't mean to be too heavy handed with that. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, then all of a sudden the anthropology breaks down and your materia turca quam and the, the end contemplated. And, you know, I mean, like I said, even the, the physical act, you, you no longer have a, an, a you're calling something a res that is neither the actus reus nor the the um, uh, men's culpable men's rea. So I like, yeah, I get thematically i think there's a strong sort of literary theme to say this is almost like worship of satan and we don't realize almost we're like doing it. almost yeah like. but but it, it, <laughs> it isn't i i would say uh, the reason that i think the worst form of ocd you can get is body anxiety is because mm -hmm. uh most most people don't know this because of what psychosomatic means it doesn't mean you're imagining something it means specifically those symptoms that body anxiety people worry about that perpetuate the symptoms or that create worse symptoms. And, and then so there are absolutely, uh, I, the, the night sweats is one example. A more classical example is they'll say psychotherapists are always next door to urology. Um, to the urological symptoms are always, if you start worrying about that, you will create and perpetuate. Uh, yep. just because and it's not magic it's not imagining something it's literally your your mind there's a mind there's a neuronal connection 
and it's called central sensitization between the mind and the gut. Um, and which is why uh, often, uh, pretty much always, uh, the irritable bowel sufferers are, are people that are really, really worried because there's the mind butt con uh, body connection, mind gut connection. There's also a mind bladder connection. So literally, you're stimulating it. You're speed through worry. You're you're like doubling your metabolism. And so you're gonna you're gonna pee more. You're gonna have more active bowel. You can make spastic colon. That this happens at a level that is not appreciated by society, which has rejected hylomorphism. So when society, when some older boomer relatives of mine, when I was going through stuff really bad when Abby was young, getting her first brain surgeries, they're like, "Well, that's just psychosomatic." I was like, "You <laughs> don't understand Aristotelianism and the fact that." creation is Aristotelian hylomorphic, there is a formal cause, um, an informed uh, cause. And therefore, it doesn't mean what you think. It doesn't mean that I made something up. It means like I worried something into actual existence. Certain organelle systems in the body are more susceptible to this than other, but they're absolutely real. They're fear created symptoms. And I'm going through another bout of those now. It, it is really bad because if you read a, a powerful OCD book like Brain Lock, which Nick gave to me, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Mike, we, Nick, we need to give Mike Brain Lock. It yeah, is, I got I to I get it. I mean, I, I, I absolutely, after this call, actually for me and my wife, it would help us both. Yeah, Thank it's you. it's powerful. But, the, you know, every and everyone's obsession, which which they usually tend to with a checking compulsion, is powerful to them. It's it's just really tough once you've created a psychosomatic symptom that you're worrying about because it's a vicious cycle. The definition of a vicious cycle. I've never heard anybody articulate it that that well. The psychosomatic piece, and I've experienced that my like my entire life since I was like a, a little boy, and like yeah. the, the link to the IBS and 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 all that too. Yeah, I've I've got that too. The the, the nocturia. Yeah, I've got that too. And you're like, wow, you just see all of these. Yeah. Anyways, I appreciate you articulating it like that, man. I mean, thanks. You know, you have 40, 40 to 45% of the neurons that you have in your brain, you have in your stomach. So you have neurons. No wonder I'm a mess sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. And also no wonder alcohol, no wonder alcohol is so often used to, to calm the mind as well. Cause you're just, mm -hmm. you're literally numbing the second mind through your entire GI tract. Yeah. Right. This is like some big brain shit. I'm like mind blown right now. Well, the, the, oh, there's a great this is why hylomorphism is yeah. true tim because if if it's not materialism which is the dominant paradigm for modern psychiatry it's all just chemicals they'll go for dualism instead where like the, the right. mind is some kind of ghostly thing that's just in the machine of the body whereas hylomorphism right. is saying no this is the, the soul is the form of the body that that's what the religion of the incarnation has to teach us it's like the way you are thinking and feeling your spiritual state as well, that can affect your body because the two are one. Right. In very real ways. They're like, yeah, I guess like if I think about my pinky finger long enough, it starts to tingle. It's like, I'm not sure if that's real. That might be imagined, but the soul does affect the body. That's the formal, formal cause. And yes, you're exactly right. Uh, well, that it, they will move if you press them. From strict deterministic materialism, whereas there's there's basically only matter, to a kind of Cartesian dualism, if you're like, right. well, what about the interaction between material causes and efficient causes? Once they acknowledge that second cause, they'll move to Descartes, and they'll say, okay, yeah, there, there is a mind that's a separate substance from a body. Um, you know, form is a separate substance from matter, the way Descartes almost admits. But what what will never be admitted after 1700, after Descartes among the rationalists and uh, Bacon among the empiricists, what they both agreed upon, they're, they're epistemological rivals, the rationalists and the empiricists, but both the leader, Descartes of the rationalists and Bacon, the leader of the empiricists, they both said we have to remove the other two causes, the most important ones, formal and final, from in investigation in the modern era. That's why um, Descartes wrote something called the Nova Morganum. Uh, he was saying the new Aristotelian organon, 
just get rid of Aristotle's big two important causes. So yes, they'll be just they'll talk about just material causes. You push them a little bit, they'll 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 move to a Cartesian dualistic position. We're like, okay, there's something kind of like soul, but it's a separate substance. And then they'll they'll be talking about um, efficient and material causes, but they will always obey Descartes and one block off bracket formal and final causation formal causes like a thought causes your stomach the cells in your stomach to, to get rumble more and to if you do it habitually give you a bad stomach ibs same thing i think with the bladder um and they'll they'll deny final causes that there are goals in nature the way descartes wanted to deny and secondly the big difference between descartes who sounds sometimes a little bit like he does believe in form and matter, they're separate substances, the soul and the body. Whereas for a human being, it is one substance. One substance has the formal cause and the material cause. The formal causes are soul, the material causes are body. When <laughs> so much so that for Thomas, Lazarus, um, I think he uses the name. You can't really use the name for Lazarus before the general judgment. Because Lazarus is only the disembodied spirit of Lazarus. A human being is a corporeal animal of a rational nature, to borrow Boethius's turn of phrase. And this means that's not Lazarus. Even, even you know, whether he's um, whether he's he got his body back or not, whether he's in purgatory, he is only Lazarus, the human substance as he's body and soul. And Descartes thinks that body and soul are two different substances. So it's really so, important. Can I just pick up on something Nick said a while ago that I think was really important? We we moved on from the conversation a bit, but you mentioned in purgatory there, reminded me of it. Nick was talking about despair being demonic, basically, and then confidence being focused on God instead pretty much one of the only worthwhile books that I actually read while studying English literature at university wasn't actually on the course at all. It was an Italian literature professor came in to give a guest lecture on Dante's divine comedy. And that was the number one. Like I was vaguely interested in Christianity at the time, but that was probably the most interesting book and above the gates of hell. You know what he's got written, Nick? Above the gates of hell in Dante's Inferno. Hope. hope abandon. Ye that mm -hmm. enter here. There's yeah. no hope there because the devil's domain is just pure despair. So that's one pole. I know exactly why you're saying that this is like worshipping the devil. Like Tim explained, it's not, strictly speaking, but that's where it ends. And right. the saints are talking about people always being at the threshold of heaven and hell moment to moment in life and despair is basically taking you to hell and then confidence if you work hard and you follow god's commands keep the precepts of the church etc you can be confident if you pray for final perseverance god wants that for you so you can hope for that reasonably and then if you make it to heaven listen to this it's so beautiful proverbs 1 33 uh, he that shall hear me shall rest without terror and shall enjoy abundance without fear of evils. Rest without terror, enjoy abundance without fear of evils. So an eternal life, because sin and separation from God are impossible, the blessed don't have any fear of evil. It's gone. So listening to all three of you talk about fear and how big a role it plays in OCD that's what we're all aiming at get to that state oh. where there's no fear um man that's so, like I, I, I want that for all of you rest in without terror enjoy abundance without fear of evils that's the goal what and, verse is that Will? <clears throat> proverbs 1 33 yeah i i appreciate the um honing of my phraseology on the worship i do i do agree it's not worship in the, the real sense because worship is proper to the human soul and i think it causes pain to us when we attend to fear 
because it's like the opposite of what our soul is designed to do, which is like worship the true, the good and the beautiful. And so when we're just like consumed with attendance to the opposite, I think that's why it's illness and why it's miserable to be in that state because it's just contrary to our our purpose. But I think a better way to describe it is let's say like your 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 wife and your kids are in the living room and they're they're playing a board game or they're about to start a movie or something and you're worried that there's um somebody in on your street uh, that there's a threat on your street and so you're standing by the window and maybe holding holding a gun or a baseball bat and you're just kind of looking looking at the just all right just one second kids one, one second honey I'll, I'll be there and just to say i just i think there's somebody out there like I, I saw something, I think there's somebody out there. And they're like, okay, all right. Five, 10 minutes go by. And they're like, dad, can we, come on. Like, I want you in, can we play the game now? Like, we want to be with you. We want to spend time with you. We're supposed to be having fun tonight. And you're like, just a second. I, I think, I think he still might be out there. And then like, imagine you just do that for like a decade. Yeah. It's, it's not that you're worshiping the man outside. Yeah. That's not what it is. It's just, I think the wife and the kids would get to a point where they would say like, I would rather risk the home being, being broken into and all of us being murdered than go another night without like spending time with you. And well, so I heard, wonder. You've heard someone you, you're close to say that. Yeah. And so I wonder if <clears throat> the purpose of these sort of tormenting mental illnesses then is God permitting you in a, in a purgative way to get to that point to like iterate in your head to the point where you get left with the option, the ultimatum of choose yeah. God and choose to delight, delight in him and trust him or basically love more the man outside. Now you don't love him. You hate him. You're afraid of him, but it's, it's almost like this twisted form of love because it's like, well, clearly your love for your wife and your kids is insufficient because if you loved them more and you'd say, well, no, I'm trying to protect them. It's like, okay, but for 10 years, he never broke down the door for 10 years. He never broke down the door. So what you actually are loving more, what you're attending to more is fear instead of God. And so the, then what sort of arises in my mind is like this image of a man that I hope to be um, the one who sort of laughs at death who laughs at the tragedy and the possibility of tragedy and is just able to delight in all of these things. And that's like sort of the, the, um, the character that you see, like John McAfee was kind of that character, you know, he always had sort of this chip on his shoulder of like, you know, whatever comes may come. I'm fine with that. And, and he was having a hell of a time up until the end. But I also remember in, uh, my favorite book of all time, being Atlas Shrugged, there's a conversation with um, Ragnar Daniskeld, spoiler alert to anybody who intends to read it, Ragnar Daniskeld and Dagny Taggart. Um, and he's a uh, a villain. He's on the run, um, but he's a good man. And he got married to his wife um, sort of in secret. And Dagny's asking him, how do you guys live with you 11 months out of the year going off doing your escapades? Um, and how do you guys endure in your marriage knowing that at any moment you could die doing what you're, what you're doing? And he said, because he believes he and his wife believe that suffering is not their birthright, that they will only suffer when tragedy strikes. And they, they believe that it's foolish and wasteful of a human life to spend any moment living out the tragedy that hasn't yet taken place. And they just have like this abundant joy in their marriage as a result of that, even though he, they, he lives a very, very high risk life. And when I hear that, when I hear that caricature, I'm like, okay, that's what I, that's what I'm shooting for. That's what I want to get to. Does Yeah. Well, shades of shades of Caesar saying, Cowards die a thousand deaths. Only the virtuous man dies once. Yeah, yeah. I gotta, I gotta get going here in a, in a minute, guys. But I wanted to end on, end, end on this. 
I was listening to an uh, an exorcist a week or two ago, and he was saying you have to look at the demonic realm uh, like a coworker that you see every day. How quickly does it take you to understand what they like in their coffee, what they order for lunch, what they like to do, these little seemingly small little habits that you take notice. And all of a sudden, within a short period of time, you know their routine. That is how the demonic views us. And so any little way, mm. any little gap that they'll come in to try to exploit, to inflame, to wedge that separation between you and God, to inflame that fear, um, they will use. So it's like being on guard and just like meditating on what St. Paul talks about in Ephesians uh, 6, that it's... it's Take not, every it's thought not, captive. Exactly. It's flesh and blood putting on the... It's, the battle is not in flesh and blood, but in, in, in the spiritual realm and putting on that full armor of God. Um, and, and to your last point, that was really really great dude it's like and this was i guess part of the the journey to back to the back to the faith is i reflect back on all the times i worried 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 and it just destroyed my health through alcohol use and sleepless nights and stress and how none zero zero of the fears ever came true zero whether it was financial or health and coming to a point where i'm so i was i'm so sick and tired of that worry that i know and looking back, all it did, and I know the devil's laughing at me because he robbed me of so much happiness. Those things never come true. And we only have to worry about them when they come true. And so that kind of snapped me out of it to now think that, you know, everything that's going to happen to me, the worst case scenario often doesn't come uh, come to pass. And if it does, use it as a means of sanctification, purification, getting myself closer to God. But in the meantime, there's like a relief that I now feel like in my spirit, there's like a sigh and it's not like I'm now sitting on a shovel while praying for a hole. I'm still being the good steward of my life, showing up every day, you know, doing what I need to do, but ultimately trusting in God's providence that this fear is only of the devil and it's meant to just wedge further and further distance. Dude, it's like a kid that like kept, kept scraping his knee over and over and over again. And finally he learns, Oh dude, I got to just tie my shoes. Yeah. Maybe if I just tied my shoes, I would Mike, scrape my knee. Mike, good God bless you that you're there. Would you just close with, maybe we can all close with this, but you have to go. So you answer it first. How then, so, so two, two, two part question. Mental health, we all seem to agree is the realm of the demonic because they have access to our psyches. Number one, everyone seems to be agreeing, but mm -hmm. let me know if, I'm oversimplifying. And two, it presents a crisis for masculinity because me, you, and Nick all just overwhelmingly uh, barked in Will's ear. Like, yes, fear is the thing. This doesn't play very well with the role of patriarch. Like, we're all natural born leaders. And so it's easy for me to make other hard decisions or fight a guy if he gets too close to the family or anything any other fear situations but when i'm in my own head it's a crisis for masculinity so just those two parts and then we know you'll peace out as everyone else answers well man i think if we even looked at the old testament patriarchs none of those guys were they they weren't without fear it's just they had more courage than they did fear that allowed them to continue to continue with the task and i i do i do agree um that I think we need to do a part a part three on this too, because there was some stuff we talked about before the recording went to crap yesterday that I think we need to address in in, in a part three. Um, but I'll say this: it's not that the fear is the problem. It's what 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 do we do with that fear? Yeah. Do we do we you know do we supplicate to it? Do we um do we capitulate? Does it throw us off track, or what do we do with that fear? If that if that causes us to run right back into our faith then it's it's a good thing it can be a very good thing it's it's just we have to understand that in those moments and, it, and it's 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 becoming clear more and cl more clear to me that when these things start to manifest if i catch them early enough they will not grow they would not they will not overwhelm me anytime i start touching my body and i palpate and whatever i'm like okay and i catch it Enough. And, I, and, that, and that's it. I get ahead of it. And instead of doing that, I find myself in, in, in the Bible and I read whatever Psalm 23. I find myself praying the rosary. I put on some Gregorian chant. I go for a walk. I get ahead of it. And instead I'm like, God, I just give it completely overwhelmingly to you submitting to your will, not to my own. Please help me not give into this fear. It's maybe still tingling in the background because our flesh is like that. You know, it's, it's weak. It's weak. 
but we have to, you know, it, it seems so rudimentary and so basic and so simple, but I can't stress this enough, at least for me, because man, I, I spent time in like the psych ward. Okay. I was like in the brief intervention unit, man. Like I, I was on all these medications. I've been addicted to alcohol. I've used drugs. I've done the thing. So for me to just say, yeah, just like pray your rosary, worship God more, go to mass, be physically disciplined and read the Bible and, and very, be careful of what you're consuming. Let it all be godly things to the glory of God and worship him in your life. And your understanding your vocation is to lead you and your family's souls to heaven. Most of your worries are going to fall away. It sounds really simple, but like, it really is that effective. It sounds like I'm making it. I sound like such a meathead and I don't mean to sound like such a meathead. I am a meathead, but those are the things that have caused, I mean, you can, you can ask my wife. She's like, you're, you're a transformed man now. Glory be to Jesus Christ. And so another thing too, that I touched on the last, sorry to be long winded. No Running away from sin as far as you can. I'm going through this right now where, and Will, I know you have experience with this, going through this convalidation process with my wife right? Where I can't participate in the sacraments. Confession and how powerful it is in making you aware of your sin and in, in driving you to avoid it is right after I walked out of the confessional, I felt like the most mentally healthy I've ever felt. And what happens even with venial sin, right? Is it eventually kind of, you want to avoid it and you're, you got the grips over it and you're strong. You commit these little sins over and over and over again, and your hands become weak. Your grip softens. And now these sins are easier to commit. Those old anxieties start to creep up a little bit more. And so I can't stress enough. I'm like, I, I, I need to get this convalidation process over with. But receive the sacraments. Go to confession often. Receive the Eucharist often. Because in that time before I knew what this convalidation process entailed of me, not that I don't feel mentally healthy now because I very much do. It was in that time that I was like, there was like no worry in my mind at all. So sin makes you stupid, just like Father Riviger said, in short. Yeah, so. all really, really good points. Well, thanks, uh, Mike. That was, I, that was yeah, a ramble. I, I apologize, guys. I love you dudes. Love, love you too, Mike. and good good stuff you, today. Mike. All right, see you Mike's, guys. Mike said a bunch of stuff today that I, I didn't I didn't know that, that, even, that even was helping me. Actually, both, all three of you guys did, but I guess we could just close. Um, Nick and then Will is mental health struggling two parts demonically generated crisis for for masculinity is it a demonically generated crisis for masculinity because it feels like it when you go through it with seven kids and a wife who are looking for you looking to you i think it involves Physical and spiritual, because that's what human beings are. And I'm sure there are some people with genetic predispositions or chemical components to it. Who knows what goes on with all the different pathways in the brain? I'm sure you can get stuck in physical processes and sometimes need meds to take the edge off them. I'm not going to downplay that. But fundamentally, we can't ignore the spiritual component to it that's going to be the most important one because it's what makes us human. And that's the component that psychiatrists and psychologists don't take seriously. And that's why I think that the actual treatments available sometimes don't even scratch the surface of what's going on. People can spend their lives going in and out of these institutions and being treated with the best that modern medicine has to offer and see either very little improvement or just get worse. So yeah. if you understand the metaphysics of what a man is, I don't see how you can deny what you're saying, Tim, which is that mental health is going to always have that spiritual element to it at the forefront. And why is suicide the biggest killer of men between ages 18 and 45? Because we're in one of the biggest spiritual crises ever, I think, in human history in terms of men's own sense of their identity and their purpose, their masculinity. So, of course, they go together. I don't think it's any coincidence that there's so much stuff in the book of Proverbs to help us with this topic because it's all about that practical wisdom. And when Nick was describing that sense of being weakened and emasculated by that wearying worry that just weighs you down every day, Listen to this. This is Proverbs 24.10. If thou lose hope, 
being weary in the day of distress, get this, Nick, thy strength shall be diminished. Mm. If thou <laughs> lose hope, being weary in the day of distress, thy strength shall be diminished. Now, as I see it, there's two things that can happen as a result of that loss of strength. When you weaken like that, you're going to crack. The devil's going to get you. Or you're going to realize that you're not strong enough to get it done by yourself, which could be the whole point of it. And then you rely on God's strength to get you through. I think for a certain kind of guy with a particular like type A mindset, like, let me at him, let me at him. I'm going to handle it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That experience of futility is the only thing that can actually bring the humility necessary for spiritual growth. Yeah. What What's the chapter and verse of that? Proverbs 24.10. I'm writing an article on Proverbs at the moment, which is why I've got some of these already down. Nice. Wow. Yeah, I'm writing all these down. Um, as you know, Tim, I'm a just tell me, tell me what to do kind of guy. Like if if there's just a possibility that some intervention could cause improvement, I'm like, screw it. I'm do like I'll I'll Amazon package that to my doorstep <laughs> tomorrow. You um, will. It's true. <laughs> and, great executor and so what i've sort of abstracted out of this entire conversation um because i'm just desperate for like okay tell me now I, I have the rest of my day ahead of me please tell me what i'm supposed to go do and because of this book brain lock i i had somewhat of an inspiration that i shared with tim of like if you can describe what ocd feels like in all of the different ways then when that arises you can just Inv uh, invalidate it as something that you have to even engage with rationally the moment that you've recognized that that's what it is and i think that that's what i'm going to try to start doing with fear is even like go go one step back behind ocd which is a specific obsession right because even that's so hard because it's so fragmented it's so multivariable of what ocd can look like but it the is. thing that's true about all of them is that it all starts with like this this squirt of adrenaline, this this fear in the amygdala. And so here's here's my strategy. This is what I'm just gonna give this a shot for a few days here. Fear is not of God. The scripture tells us this. If I experience fear, I'm going to make an act of the will to stop feeling it. Now, I know this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm I think it's akin to the command repent. When when the command is repent, it's not feel sorry for your sins. This is why you can go to confession without perfect contrition. Now it's better you're a better person. You have, you know, further along the the degree of Aristotle's continence of virtue if you also felt shame and sorrow for your sins, but that's not, that's not the command. The command is repent, which means turn 180 degrees and walk in the other direction. So I'm going to try and just like Pavlovian style, shut down my brain, my will. The moment I experience something that I know is fear. And I'm also going to do a novena to St. Dymphna, who uh, is my girlfriend's patron saint. I, she brought this up. I had never heard of this saint, 650 in Ireland, 650 AD in Ireland. Patron saint of mental illness. It's her confirmation saint. I'm going to do a novena to that. And then the last quote that I'll leave this on is, um, what I imagine, it's not as good as well done, my good and faithful servant, but a similar sentiment to what it must feel like to greet God in heaven is uh, once again, referring to Atlas Shrugged, spoiler alert. When Dagny crashes her plane and she wakes up and John Galt is holding her, the first words out of her mouth, seeing, this is why I believe that John is the logos in this book, seeing his face, she says, we never had to take any of it seriously, did we? She whispered. And he replies, no, we never had to. That's what I imagine it's like to see Christ and just the the hell we put ourselves through, or at least that we agreed yeah. to. Yeah, yeah.
of course it's easier said than i mean it's easier then than now course, because you're like well i made it you know it's it's kind of like if you're behind by 20 points in a basketball game and you're like oh we're gonna lose this game you do get your act together you end up winning by a point at the end of the fourth quarter you're like we never needed to fear it's like well the that's the tricky part that's what i struggle with where i'm like the fear does chase in us so i it I, chases you know, us but allegedly allegedly we're down only by one the whole time and we think we're down by 20. yeah yeah and and, and fear is not of god i i was i was disappointed mike had to go because you are th like i mean again this is this is i think the the, the per this is such a great group of guys um for this topic and other topics but so much insight from each of the four I just, with, with Mike, he feels the OCD fear, check, and he's a current patriarch, check. Um, Will's a current patriarch. Nick, you feel the OCD fear. I just, I wanted, and, my, and Mike didn't respond to the question before he bounced. I was like, what kind of crisis is it for patriarchy? Like, everyone knows out there, you know, that like we stand for the, 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 christian version the biblical version of patriarchy me will mike and what the, the way nick's going to set up his household you know people read uh case for patriarchy and they're like okay this seems this seems to just be the gospel and that's all i did was the gospel and the magisterium and i ruminated on it some and made some connections but what there is some sort of crisis experience. I mean, my wife listens to me. My kids listen to me. My teenagers do not roll their eyes at me. Like my teenagers are, I, I think this is one of the big tests for whether or not a man's a good patriarch is you don't even have to look at whether the wife obeys. That's sort of the liquidity of whether or not they're a good patriarch. But how do the teenagers regard him? I've never been to Will Nolan's house. Nick's about to go, but I know what kind of man Will Noland is, I know his teenagers respect him. I know my teenagers will respect me. And, and that's a, a big tell. It's difficult when you are being heated and listened to and looked at to, to go through something tough, like particularly something fear-based, because I'm always telling the kids, don't worry about that. I got you on that. Don't worry. Oh, some, some teenagers came by on a golf cart and yelled something at you. I'll go find them. Uh, you, you know, if there's a scary guy, I'll in the parking lot, I'll go confront him if there's a whatever, like, but when they see me scared, it presents a crisis for masculinity. And this I, I wanted to hear Mike talk about that firsthand. I don't know if either of you guys have concluding thoughts. I'm just saying that uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about its whatness. I don't. That's one trick I just haven't learned yet. It's the only thing that ever tug at the threads of of my patriarchy i mean everything else it's like i've got an order i feel like what um what i notice is that a lot of guys in nick's situation they might not have ocd but they do have a big fear that it's not even possible to take step one towards getting married having a family i think that's a big part of what we're talking about because that's a lack of confidence in their ability to actually carry out what is after all a divine command for the majority of men be fruitful and multiply like marriage is the first command for adam and eve out of eden and for young guys to think that they know best and that it's impossible and it can't be done that's a really crippling lack of confidence about their vocation in life so it starts even before their patriarchs and just thinking about moving in that direction and yeah. what you've done with the case for patriarchy, Tim, is is so great because it's kind of like pulling guys to a crusade saying, this is what we need to do. Here's the battlefield. Here's the plan. Now we go out, move, reclaim that territory. And you can learn from the attitude of the crusaders who went into the Holy Land because a lot of them were the heads of great families and they bankrupted themselves to go. Many died on the way just from dysentery and other diseases. But the ones who actually made it all the way and got to see the fighting action, one of the main ones that's always stood out to me is Prince Bohemond of Antioch. And he was renowned for being like a last stand guy. And at Antioch, they got surrounded. I think it was like between 10 and 15 to 1. 
by a Muslim force that besieged the city and they were getting starved. They, they were going to die if they just stayed inside. And rather than being paralyzed by fear and thinking the Muslims are coming, there's more, what are we going to do? Um, he just did. And I think um, when they ride out in Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings, I think it's based on this. I have to look into it, but it seems so similar. Bohemond yeah. opened up the gate and he took a few guys with him and just rode right out into the Muslim forces that massively outnumbered them. And he won. And the Crusaders themselves couldn't even believe it. They were looking around like, did we just do that? And then the the, the tales afterwards, people saw like a, a mounted a contingent of saints coming down from the skies and Bohemond himself couldn't believe it either. But it just goes to show like that's the confidence, right? Seemingly impossible odds. And he rides out anyway because he believes. Yeah. It's beautiful. I'll I'll <laughs> not I'll not be political this time, Tim, and answer the question I wish you asked. I'll actually answer the question that you asked, <laughs> which is uh, is this a masculinity crisis? Yes. I think it feels like a, a it pulls at the threads of our masculinity because it does. Succumbing to fear is incompatible with masculinity. And when I asked you and our mutual friend about an interpersonal conflict that I had, where I was like, I know I have to have X, Y, and Z conversation. It's hard. I'm struggling with fortitude. Like, how do I get fortitude? You guys told me you get it by doing it. There is no podcast. There's no life hack. There's no system. I always like to try and break things down into pieces and like do each little. Yeah. It's like you literally just freaking do it. You have to just become a harp, a harpist by harping, like Aristotle by says. By harping. And so I think what I said before is what has to be done, which is like when you recognize the experience of fear you stop being afraid as an act of will in the same way that like when you doubt God, you, you will as you, you make an act of will and have faith. Um, and so also on the diabolic question, Satan doesn't attend to those he has nothing to worry about with. I think we should take solace in that fact. If we were not a threat, whatsoever if we had nothing to offer we would have nothing to fear either it's not fear itself i think that's um wrong obviously because courage is being afraid of the right things and then taking the right action in that phase but like there's a reason why some people are plagued with fears more than others and i think it is to keep us in the miasma to keep our feet stuck in the mud and the way out is just an act of will and that is masculinity in my mind. And and understand that you're going to suffer in all kinds of ways in your life because that's what original sin involves. You're also going to suffer the consequences of the actual sins you commit. And even if there might be suffering that's not directly caused by you, you still might deserve it in all kinds of other ways for other stuff right. that you've done in your life. So, so when suffering comes your way, either accept that this is just the way life is because you're in a fallen world, you brought it on yourself, or you can offer it up for someone else, for example, as a penance. And that's a really beautiful use of it. Sure. Don't be surprised that life is tough. Scripture teaches that, that us that the life of man is a warfare. And Aquinas has this great point, which is like earth shattering for some guys who are stuck in this mindset that everything's supposed to be like skipping, happy, overflowing with joy the whole time. Aquinas makes the point that some measure of sadness is actually the mark of a well-adjusted mind. And it's worse to be in high spirits the whole time, like giddy, like a silly kid, than to be a bit down. So sometimes, you know, if my wife says, Yo, what are you thinking about? Or my kids would be like, you're okay, dad. And I don't tell them what I'm thinking about. I say, yeah, I'm fine. But really, I'm thinking about bad stuff. So I don't have to. And that's okay. And it'll be like that for many, many years. Because like the man's job is to face that so that his 
kids can feel that kind of peace or his wife can, even if he might not know it. Yeah. And that's okay. So right. true. Imagine for this, this live, this will be our outro. Beautiful thoughts. Will and Nick and Mike, who's not here. Imagine this is my favorite scene from one of my favorite movies, Ghostbusters. The scene is called Ray and Winston talk religion. Imagine that they're not Ghostbusters. And I, I, I hate psychotherapy. Imagine that they are not Ghostbusters, but psychotherapists and listen to what, what they say to each other in this scene. Then we'll, we'll close it here. Ray and Winston talk religion. These are the blueprints for the structural ironwork in Dana Barrett's apartment building. And they're very, very strange. Hey, Ray, do you remember something in the Bible about the last days when the dead would rise from the grave? I remember Revelation 7:12. And I looked as he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, and the seas boiled, and the skies fell. Judgment Day. Judgment Day. Every ancient religion has its own myth about the end of the world. Myth? Ray, has it ever occurred to you that maybe the reason we've been so busy lately is because the dead have been rising from the grave? <laughs> How about a little music? Yeah. Both all both all tripped out. So imagine they're psychotherapists. That's why everyone's mentally unwell, is because you know we're we're at the twelfth or, or maybe the eleventh hour. That's 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 all I have to offer. That's an incredibly base scene, and anybody should be proud to dress as Winston. Uh, there's this funny scene in Stranger Things too, where uh, Lucas doesn't want to be Winston just because they're both black, and I'm like. Winston's the coolest man, and even though he came late and he's not a scientist, he's the Christian. He's the one that's like, this ain't a myth, bro. I love that. And I've always loved that. That's great. I love it. God bless you guys. I, I'm jealous Nick gets to go out and meet Will soon. And uh, we'll probably maybe do a show or something from then. But until then, Will, be well, my friend. It's great to see you. I'm glad we got this show done, even though it was like diabolically interfered with when we recorded it yesterday. <laughs> now we, we had Will Noland, whereas we didn't yesterday. So it's all the better for it. Nick, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Like literally very soon. Uh, God bless you all. Uh, see mask viewers, parish orphans, retrogrades. Stay strong through your mental travails. It's part of life.